Welcome. Thank you for uh, for being here. I'm happy to talk to you today about uh, this uh, issue that we're facing in the Los Padres National Forest. My name is Bryant Baker. I am the Director of Conservation and Research at Los Padres Forest Watch. We are a nonprofit conservation organization based in Santa Barbara, but we work to protect the Los Padres National Forest and other public lands throughout the region. Uh, if you've been following our work for the last several years, one of the things that we deal with a lot, uh, especially especially more recently, are uh, big vegetation clearing projects, projects that are proposed by the uh, US Forest Service, usually uh, under some sort of justification like fire mitigation. Uh, and these projects can uh, have some serious impacts on the environment. Um, but they also are have questionable efficacy in terms of are they actually helping mitigate wildfires down the road? So I'm gonna talk a lot about that today. And today I'm also going to be focusing very specifically on this new project that was proposed, uh, gosh, what is it? It's September now. This was proposed, I think at the very end of July, and it is called the Ecological Restoration Project. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about why uh, we, we disagree with that, that name. Um, but it is a massive, massive project, and I'm going to focus today on just the Kern and Ventura counties portion of this of this project. If you want to see uh, the webinar that we did previously, that was sort of just a more general overview of the project area uh, across the entire Los Padres, then you can go and check that out. We have it on our website, also on our YouTube channel. Uh, I, I will try to put a link below whatever, wherever you're watching this, whether it's on our website or, or on YouTube, I'll put a link below um, to our previous webinar. So I'm gonna start uh, sharing my screen here. So uh, again, we're just gonna talk about Ventura and Kern counties today, but just to give you a really brief overview, this is again, a project uh, the Forest Service is calling it the Ecological Restoration Project. It is 235,000 acres total. Uh, and, and it's split up into two different sort of project areas, right? There are 48,000 acres of what they're calling forest health treatment units, and then 186,000 acres of what they're calling fuel break and defense zones. And I'll talk a little bit about the difference between those. And just to give you a sense of, this is the Los Padres National Forest. This, uh, this is what we call the Southern Los Padres. And then this is the Monterey Ranger District. This is Big Sur, that area, right? And so the project stretches from the far like northeastern part of the uh, or just the eastern side of the southern los padres uh, to make it really confusing all the way up to san luis obispo that area and then there are uh, several areas within the monterey ranger district that are included as well and so you can see the yellow areas, those are the, what, what again, we're calling the, uh, the, the Forest Service is calling the fuel break and defense zones. And then these, these brown areas, those are the forest health treatment units. Now, to understand just how truly massive this project is, if you look, if you squint, uh, you might be able to see some red areas. Those are projects that have been proposed and or approved very recently that we've been dealing with. So here's a, a good example of one. This little sliver here, that's the Pine Mountain Project or the Reyes Peak Project. That was proposed back in 2020 and it was approved last year. And uh, it is currently being litigated by us and a number of other groups, uh, including Patagonia and the County of Ventura and the City of Ojai. So that was 755 acres. And then, and then again, we are dealing with a 235,000 acre project now. Uh, that is over 300 times the size of the Reyes Peak Project or the Pine Mountain Project. Now, today, I'm I'm going to just focus on this area here. This is uh, Ventura and so northern Ventura County and southern Kern County. Uh, the Ojai Ranger District, which you can see down here, that was excluded from this project, mainly because the environmental um, review process that's going on right now is being funded, uh, at least in part, or, or possibly entirely by uh, PG&E. They gave the Forest Service a $1.7 million grant to do this work. So, and we can talk about that later in the Q&A session, if, if you'd like, but PG&E doesn't have coverage in this area. This is um, Southern California Edison area here. So 
I think for that reason, the Ojai Ranger District was excluded. Now you'll notice there's a little sliver down here that is actually Ventura County, but it's um, technically part of the Santa Barbara Ranger District. I'm, I'm not, there's not much there. I'm not gonna talk really about that. So we're gonna focus up here, okay? So we'll zoom in a little bit here. And now you can see roads and trails and um, there's, there's multiple types of trails here. There are hiking trails, non-motorized trails. Those can also be used uh, generally for, um, for horseback riding outside of wilderness. They can also allow mountain biking, just depending on where you are. Uh, and then there's also off-road vehicle trails. So these are not technically roads. They're, they're, they're designated as OHV trails, off-roading vehicle trails. Uh, so if you're if you're into that uh, and you've been up to like the Ballinger Canyon area, that's that's this area up here. And so what you'll notice is that a lot of these fuel break and defense zones, um, they tend to follow trails and roads. Not always. Um, sometimes they're just sort of off away from roads and trails. And this um, the, these these ones that are kind of away from existing roads and trails, those are usually following a public private land boundary. Um, so there's some kind of arbitrary nature to how a lot of this was delineated. I mean, look at, you know, that's not following any road or trail, but if I remember correctly, that was a fire line, a dozer line that was created during the 2006 day fire, I believe. Um, Think that's I think that's the fire that it was created for. So that was just, um, and I can I can pull up Google Earth at some point and show you what I'm talking about there. Uh, so so anyway, the the point is there are a lot of these fuel breaks and defense zones that are just sort of crisscrossing the landscape. And again, this is called an ecological restoration project. When I see uh, when I see these kind of patterns, you know, especially when I see like right angles and squares and straight lines, that doesn't really scream ecological restoration to me. Uh, and then there's, of course, the forest health treatment units, these, these brown areas. A lot of these are on the slope, uh, the slopes of Fraser Mountain, Alamo Mountain down here. This is Seward Mountain. This is Mount Pinos. Uh, that's the summit of Mount Pinos, and it's entirely included within the project area. Uh, and then a lot of Takuya Ridge, if, if any of you who are watching remember, we um, were still fighting this project uh, along Takuya Ridge that was proposed uh, Four, four years ago now, I wanna say. And uh, th this project would essentially expand that, that project quite significantly, uh, but it would also include areas that were not included in the Takuya Ridge project, but over here by Antimony Mountain, uh, Brush Mountain, that area. So if we look at the breakdown in terms of counties, uh, Kern County and Ventura County, you know, they're, uh, Kern County is just, it's a very small portion of the Los Padres, it's Southern Kern County. Um, but that's where, you know, a lot of Mount Pinos is and the entire San Emilio Mountains for the most part, uh, Cuddy Valley, those kind of places, part, parts of Fraser Mountain. Um, and, and, it's, and it's a lot, I mean, it's based, you know, there's a, a huge chunk of the Kern County portion of Los Padres included within this project. Uh, and the same with uh, the Northern Ventura County. If you're curious about trails that could be impacted by this, these are the, the trails that are within the project area and the percentages are the percent of the trail length that is within the project area. So the Blue Ridge Trail, for example, this is up by um, Antimony Mountain. This is kind of going off toward, uh, it's in Southern Kern County in the San Emilio Mountains, kind of going towards Bitter Creek uh, National Wildlife Refuge or Wind Wolves, that, that area generally. Uh, the entire trail is within this project area. Uh, most of the trail that you would take from um, the parking lot at the top of Mount Pinos, if you're trying to go over to the summit, you know, you walk along kind of, it seems like an old road. Um, it, we, we call this the Mount Pinos Summit Trail. It also includes a little bit of the Tumamayat Trail. Uh, about 94% of that is included in the project, so almost the entire thing. Uh, and then so on and so forth. There are a lot of trails that are within the, this particular area, Kern, Kern County and, and Northern Ventura County that are uh, included within the project and could be pretty heavily impacted. So let's talk about the, the forest health treatment units. And for any of you who have already watched the previous webinar, or maybe you were there um, when, it, when, when I was doing it live, you're gonna recognize some of the stuff that I'm gonna go through, but I think it's important to 
explain all of this each time. So this is again, 48,000 acres total. I don't remember the exact number um, in our area of focus today. I can, I can look that up later if anyone's curious. But what this would allow is the cutting of trees up to 24 inches in diameter. That's about the size of this tree. This was a 23 and a half. That's me for scale. I'm um, a little under six feet tall, uh, just to give you a sense of the, the size there. These are not small trees, these, these 24 inch trees. And this could be done using mechanical methods. So that would be like feller bunchers, you know, heavy, heavy equipment that uh, are designed to actually to cut trees and move them around. Uh, it can also be done with chainsaws, you know, hand cutting, uh, but they also allow mowing and masticating and chipping and pile burning. So, uh, and I'll show you a little bit of that here in, here in a moment. So what does this actually look like on the ground? So if we look at it from the air, so we're, we're now looking at satellite imagery, we're looking down uh, on the Plumas National Forest. This is up in, in Northern California. Uh, and this is an area that actually just burned in the Dixie Fire last year, interestingly enough. Uh, but I just happened to notice this. I was looking at some satellite imagery, I don't know, a couple of years ago, I think um, right before the Pine Mountain Project. And I, I came across this project uh, called the Cradle Valley Forest Health Project. And this has a lot of the same type of language, you know, it's, it's um, to increase forest health, it's to open up the forest and make it more, you know, resilient or resistant to wildfire and, and bark beetles and disease and things like that. Um, I think they allowed the removal of up to 30 inch trees in this project. And it was approved using a categorical exclusion, very similarly to how the Pine Mountain project was approved, for example. So this is it before the project was actually implemented. And you can see this is a very open, this is ponderosa pine mostly, uh, very open forest. If you were to remove these tree shadows, I mean, you you would really get a sense that this is um, a, a, an already open, open forest. Um, this, this is not a dense forest by any, any measure. Uh, but they still wanted to go in and do quite a bit of cutting and, and open it up even, even more. But this is what it looks like during or right toward the end of the project implementation. So you can see uh, these are log decks. These are where they actually cut, uh, they stacked up their cut trees. Those are the, the tree canopies that have been cut off. Those will likely be, uh, well, I, I don't know. I don't know exactly what they did with, with all this material, but those might have been pile burned. And that's usually what happens with those. Um, these were, I have another image that I don't have on this presentation, but you can actually see the, the like truck that they were putting this in. Um, I don't think they were using this as timber. I think these were actually being uh, sent to a biomass facility, but I, I don't know that for sure. Uh, but what you can see is these are the impacts of that heavy equipment use on the landscape, right? These are what we call skid trails. This is from um, these machines moving back and forth, you know, going out here, cutting, uh, cutting trees, moving them back to what this is called as, uh, as a landing. This is where they, they stack all the logs. And so you can see there's a road that runs right here. But anytime, <laughs> anytime the heavy equipment's involved, you know, in these types of projects, um, you have to make these, tr these like, trails or almost like little miniature logging roads um, all over the landscape in order to do the cutting. Uh, so yeah, they they really opened this up even more um, and, and it just seemed like it was pretty impactful on the landscape. This is from a, a project on Figaro Mountain that's still ongoing. This is a non-commercial project. So they did not, um, they had a diameter limit. I don't remember what it was, but it was lower than 24 inches uh, and they aren't you know, the, the Forest Service wasn't uh, selling this material, you know, to a timber company or anything like that. Uh, but you can still see uh, th these are where they often pile up. This is what we call like slash piles. Basically, uh, these would eventually be burned through what is called pile burning. Um, but for for years, I mean, it can look like this on the on uh, the landscape in these project areas. Uh, it, it can be quite quite a mess. Uh, here's another non-commercial project with a, I don't remember what diameter limit this was, uh, maybe 10 inches or 14 inches. I can't, I can't remember. It was, it was definitely much lower than 24 inches. And you can kind of see by the, the size of the trees that were cut. This is on Cerro Noro Este. Uh, this is from a project that was approved many, many years ago. And they uh, were just getting up to this area on sort of on the top of the mountain. 
And you can see a lot of slash material hasn't even been piled. And it was like this for, I think, all of last summer or the summer before. Um, I don't know exactly what the area looks like now, if, if, if those, um, you know, all the slash has been piled and burned or not yet, but uh, it, it can take a long time. It can take years to actually do the pile burning. Uh, so in the meantime, there's a lot of piles on the landscape or even slash on the, on the forest floor. Uh, and that, that can increase fire, um, fire risk quite a bit. So these are your more standard commercial thinning operations. This is from Northern California, I think and somewhere in the Northern Sierra. Uh, this is mixed conifer forest. And you can see large trees being cut uh, through this thinning operation. Now, when people hear the word thinning, they think, I think a lot of folks will probably envision people going out and like cutting little saplings and small trees or pruning trees, something like that. But most of the time, uh, you know, in California, we see these projects that they look more like this, where it's, it's almost like an understory or midstory clear cut, uh, where they're really going in and cutting a lot of trees. And a lot of overstory trees are removed as well. Uh, so you can see there's not a lot going on in the understory um, in this area uh, after the project is implemented. And then um, this is another area, I think this is Eastern, I wanna say this is Eastern Oregon. Uh, these are not my photos. Uh, uh, all the photos you see, except where I specifically say otherwise, um, that they are my photos and they're, they're almost all from the Los Padres National Forest and most of them are from the project area. Uh, but I, I didn't have good examples of these larger, more intensive thinning operations, but uh, some, some of my colleagues did. So these are the piles. Again, these, um, these piles can be left for, for a very long time. You can actually see a lot of piles out there uh, and they can take a while before they actually do the burning, but they have really opened this forest up to, uh, <laughs> to the point where it's almost more like a, a pine savanna or something. Uh, here's another area in Northern California, mixed conifer forest, a lot of white fir. You can see in here, um, this might even have some lodgepole pine in it, which we don't have down here in the Los Padres. Uh, but yeah, big stumps, a lot of slash on the ground. And this is from, I think from the same project, that's one of those really big slash piles. I mean, these are just enormous. Um, uh, and then these are some of the trees that they actually cut and stacked. This is a log deck. So you can see these are not just small trees being removed. And I do see some of you are already asking questions about this, but what the point of this is that the Forest Service is saying that these forests are too dense and they have to go in and remove trees. And the way they'll sort of pitch this to the public is by saying, we're going to focus on small trees, right? Because the small trees can, um, they can, they can start burning if a fire comes through. Um, they can send flames up into the canopies of the larger trees, and then you've got, you know, crown fire happening or, um, you know, where most of the trees die. And, you know, th definitely a lot of small trees are removed, but when they are wanting to make these economically viable, they will allow quite a bit of large tree cutting because that is what, um, you know, timber companies are more interested in. Uh, and, and so, there's a lot of large tree cutting with, with this, but there's also just, I, I think the Forest Service is just saying in a lot of cases, they want to really increase um, the, or decrease the canopy cover just in general across these forested areas. So uh, uh, they, you know, they'll take it from like a 50% canopy cover down to 25% you know, canopy cover. I mean, it, massive reductions in, in the number of trees. Uh, and, I, and I'll talk a little bit about, you know, why, uh, this is this is sort of a misguided uh, approach in a lot of a lot of cases. But the other aspect of this project are the fuel break and defense zones. So these are across 186,000 acres. Uh, so this is sort of the meat of the project. And I would say this is not. Um, they're not even really describing this as forest health. This is just to try to basically stop or slow fires on the landscape. And they would allow in forested areas. I mean, you can remove trees up to any any age, size, um, and, and, you know, these are all native trees that they're going to be focusing on uh, and native vegetation in general. Uh, but yeah, any, any size tree can be removed in these fuel break and defense zones. And uh, there's a lot of activities that can be allowed through this uh, mechanical, you know, again, heavy equipment, use of heavy equipment, mastication. Uh, but there are also things like, um, uh, what was it? Yeah, targeted grazing, um, mowing, just all sorts of stuff. Now they will, they do say some hardwood and or conifer trees will be retained. 
it's just like I, I I never like when I see vague language like that. You know what what does that mean? Some some trees will be retained. I don't I don't know what that means. Um, that that has no legal weight whatsoever. Uh, so I mean, you could you could you could you could remove all but two trees. You know, in, a, in an entire field break. That would be some trees would be retained. So anytime we see things like that, that um, certainly uh, it makes us uh, concerned. So a lot of the fuel breaking defense zones are focused on more shrubland type habitats, especially outside of Ventura County and Kern County. So like, especially in Santa Barbara County and San Luis Obispo County, it's really going to be focusing on chaparral. But uh, this is what these masticators look like. So this is how we think most of the fuel breaks will probably be constructed is through mastication, especially in the, sh in the shrubbier areas. And so this was up on East Camino Cielo, um, definitely on Camino Cielo. I think it was East Camino Cielo. This is a, a masticator. Um, you can see it's just grinding down uh, these native shrubs. I don't know who who's being left here. Maybe it isn't long, you know, <laughs> doesn't have much longer uh, before this, you know, after this photo was taken. But you can see that what these do is they basically just grind shrubs down into, into sort of a mulch. And it's pretty pretty intensive and, and, and hard to, to watch. This is, I think, from the same project. These are uh, photos that our executive director took back in, I want to say 2006, something like that, maybe uh, along East Camino Cielo. And you can see they make these big wide swaths where there's just not really anything left. Here's what one of these areas looks like sort of on the ground. Sometimes they'll leave, you know, scattered shrubs here and there and they'll call it a shaded field break or something. It's just, you know, it's a little ridiculous. But yeah, not uh, not a good situation ecologically for a lot of reasons. Here's another one that I viewed this earlier this year in the Cleveland National Forest. This was not so much through mastication as it was, I think, through hand cutting, because you can see a lot of piles. So there's a lot of piles that are created here and they'll eventually be pile burned. Uh, but this is also in, in mature chaparral and uh, it, it just is it's really hard on on these landscapes and in these ecosystems and there's a lot of non-native plants that that will um, you know thrive in, under these these conditions and eventually because these will be maintained over and over and because of just the way a lot of ecological feedback loops work well, what you see over time is that these pro these these fuel breaks sort of convert um, to usually just like one or you know a couple species of non-native grasses and weeds. In this case, this is in the Santa Barbara area. This is the this is along West Camino Cielo. This was a field break that was created back in the 70s. And you can see it is now instead of you know Chaparral, which is all of this you know mountain range, it is uh, wild oats primarily. That's this this little guy right here in the foreground. Um, that is a non-native grass, annual grass species. Uh, there's also a lot of mustard in there, but you can't see it very well at this time of year. So one of the things that I talked about in my last webinar, but I think is especially pertinent to the Kern County and Ventura County areas, is just this sort of concept that all of the forested uh, areas, and, I, and I, should, I should make this clear, the Los Padres National Forest, of course, is called a national forest, but most of it is actually not forested at all. It is mostly... Um, shrubland. It's mostly chaparral, coastal sage scrub, things like that. Uh, and, and even in um, Kern County and Ventura County, there's a lot of uh, other ecosystem types that are not really the forest types that we generally talk about when we talk about, you know, um, thinning and uh, fire resilience and things like that. Uh, but one of the things that the Forest Service is really trying to, you know, convince the public of is that all of our forested areas, small as they may be, are just really dense and overgrown. They haven't burned in a very long time. Uh, and that, that's why they've got to go in and, and you know, do a lot of maintenance, a lot of thinning and, uh, and clearing so that they can um, protect these larger trees. But I, I, I've been to a lot of places in the Los Padres and um, there's a lot of what we call spatial heterogeneity. There's a lot of uh, diversity on the landscape in terms of forest structure. And, and that's, that's, a, that's a good thing generally um, because a lot of different species of wildlife uh, they require different habitat, you know, structure and, and type. So some some um, some species really like this open forest, and some species really like dense forest. And that's just all there is to it. It's it's uh, it's complex, but it's kind of simple when you really start breaking it down. 
but one thing that I've noticed is that a lot of forest, a lot of the truly forested places in the Los Padres are, are a lot more open than the Forest Service, I think, would have you uh, have you think. So this is in the Chumash Wilderness. This is along North Fork Lockwood um, Trail. And this area has no fire history. I mean, no recorded fire history. It has no recorded management history, you know, at least over the last many, many decades. Um, it's incredibly open. I mean, this is as open as it gets. This is um, mostly Jeffrey pine. There's a little bit of ponderosa pine in here. There's hardly any white fir uh, that I see. So it, this is true, what we would call like yellow pine forest or, or Jeffrey ponderosa pine forest. And it is very, very open. And there's not much going on in, in the understory except for a lot of native grasses. That's what you're actually seeing here. These are, this is squirrel tail grass mostly. Uh, a lot of native grasses, and depending on the time of year, you'll probably see some, some wildflowers and other things. Um, but it, it's important to understand that there are a lot of things that are affecting whether or not forests become dense or not. And a lot of it has to do with soil type and climate. Here's another area. This is in the Sespe Wilderness, same situation, uh, but this is on Pine Mountain. This is a little bit more mixed conifer. You can see there's some white fir. There's also some sugar pine in this area, but, but most of this is Jeffrey pine here. Uh, and this is on Cerro Noroeste. So this is a completely different mountain, same forest type very open, no recorded fire history, no recorded management history. Um, yeah, it's not it's not like this dense overgrown thing that the Forest Service sort of is saying it is uh, in, in a lot of places. Uh, this is in the project area too, if I remember. Uh, I think I think that's correct. And then this is Mount Pinos. this is the this is pretty pretty high up on Mount Pinos. This is mostly Jeffrey Pine here. Uh, very open forest conditions. I know of no like thinning that has occurred here. Um, there may have been prescribed fire done several decades ago, but it's it's hard to tell because we don't have good records. Um, I don't see it in any of the fire databases that I have, but it doesn't mean that it didn't happen. Um, and this is the one place where I think that it could have happened, uh, but they weren't going out here and doing a bunch of tree cutting before, before they did prescribed fire. And I can talk about that later. Um, this is on Pine Mountain. So one of the things that I think there's this this idea that as long as forests are really open, that they won't um, be susceptible to various natural disturbances like bark beetles or or wildfire. Uh, this is on Pine Mountain. No recent fire history, um, but you can see, and it's and it's super open. Um, but you can see that a lot of these large mature trees have have died uh, mostly because of drought and bark beetles. And it's just the simple aspect of this is that um, trees die. They have they have <laughs> they have life expectancies that are not as long as you might think Jeffrey Pines, they you know they live maybe 400 years um, if, if if they're in really good site conditions, you know, but but often they you know they live for 200 or 300 years and um, and they die from drought or bark beetles or wildfire or uh, wind knocks them over, lightning strikes them. I mean there's all sorts of different reasons. These are natural mortality agents. Uh, and just because the forest is open doesn't mean that these trees don't die. Um, they, uh, you know, the Forest Service is basically saying when it's super dense, these trees will die because they don't have enough water because all these other trees are, are you know, stealing the water or something. Uh, but we do see these these open areas. They they often have quite a bit of mortality. Um, and the, and just the issue is that we're in a very very dry period right now. Uh, climate change is ramping up uh, in this region. And a lot of trees that came up under moist, you know, cooler, moister conditions are just not doing very well. Uh, and until we reverse climate change, that that's not that's not going to change very much. The other thing that I think is really important to understand is that uh, small trees are an important part of these forests, and they have been for a long time. This is from a really cool paper in 2015 about historical forest structure in the Western United States. And they were looking at, um, I think they were looking at pretty much purely ponder, like yellow pine forest, maybe some mixed conifer too. And they did have uh, a little bit of area in, in uh, California that they were studying. And what you see, what you're really seeing here is that uh, these like, if you go farther this way, these are smaller tree size classes. And so there's a lot of uh, trees in a given area that would have been quite small. Uh, they actually came up with this uh, sort of average 
uh, and it was 51 to 90 or 52 to 92 percent of total trees across all of their study areas, uh, or about 61, um, almost 62 percent of trees overall uh, in the Western U.S. in these forest types were were quite small. And this is not a bad thing. These trees are uh, what allow forests to grow. Right? You have to have young trees. You have to have small trees, uh, but they can actually help with long-term resilience. You know, you can have an area, uh, maybe it's hit by bark beetles or drought and uh, you know several trees that came up again under cooler moisture conditions they they succumb more easily uh, but you know these these younger trees that come up during those periods uh, they can uh, you know withstand those conditions in the future better um, so young trees can help with uh, you know forest succession and, and, and selection the other thing is in terms of fire regimes um, these forest types were not purely characterized by low severity, high frequency fire. That's that's kind of the predominant way of thinking in the Forest Service is that um, a lot of these forests historically would have had fire really frequently and it would have always been burning at low intensity or low severity. Um, but there's a lot of debate about this in the literature. Uh, and there's a whole side of this debate that has found a lot of really good evidence that these forests historically were characterized by what we call mixed severity fire. Um, and this would have been the, the the predominant fire regime across most of Western North America in these forest types, uh, which mixed conifer, again, mixed conifer and yellow pine forest. And so what is mixed severity fire? Uh, it, it's really simple. It just means that when a fire occurs in these forests, that it doesn't just occur as one sort of fire effect, right? Um, if it was all just purely low severity, you would see nothing but green canopies here in this photo, because this is right after the, the rim fire in, in Sierra Nevada by Yosemite. This is uh, one year post fire. And what you see here is, in fact, there's actually this sort of mosaic that is created by the fire on the landscape. So you've got a lot of low severity. That's where you see mostly green canopies. But you also have these areas where there's um, quite a few trees die, uh, but you also have still quite a few that are, are have survived. And then you have these patches where most of the trees die or all of the trees die in the fire. Uh, and this again creates what we call spatial heterogeneity on the landscape. And it creates really complex habitat structure that is quite important to a lot of different species. There's some cool papers about this. Uh, this one is one of the sort of um, seminal studies on this um, th this topic, and it was about birds specifically. And so you can see uh, some birds really like high severity and moderate severity fire, like hairy woodpeckers. This is where, um, if you're in an area that has uh, has any amount of you know post fire forest, um, this is where you would find hairy woodpeckers uh, more often. Uh, but there are other you know, birds like ruby crowned kinglets that really like unburned areas, right? And then there are birds that, you know, uh, like low severity or maybe they like moderate severity. Uh, and this is true for a lot of different species, not just those ones. Same with owls, um, like great horned owls, they like low severity or even unburned forest. Uh, but screech owls and pygmy owls, they do really well in higher severity areas to the point where um, they actually utilize these these higher severity fire patches more so than um, unburned or low low severity patches. And it's the same with uh, insects, uh, bees especially. There are, there's a lot of cool papers that have found that bee diversity and abundance um, will increase with uh, increasing fire severity. That's kind of what you're seeing here. And bats, um, I'm just giving you sort of a like a sampling of all the different uh, you know, ways you can look at this, but but bats are another cool one people don't really think about so often. Uh, some bats really prefer these open, um, you know, shrubby areas with a lot of snags uh, or, you know, these standing dead trees. This is like high severity fire here. Uh, and other bats really like dense, unburned forest. So the other concept to all this is like, okay, well, those high severity patches, they, um, oh, my voice is really low. Anyone else having problems hearing me? I just heard. I just got a just got a message saying my voice is low. It's it's low as in it's like deep, right? Um, 
Okay. Uh, I'm going to cut this out of the recording. So I'm going to mention you, Graciela. Thank you for uh, for telling me. But I think it might be on your end because it's um, and other people are saying it's fine. So I'm just I'm confused. Uh, you're saying it's going in and out. All right, I'm going to keep going. If anyone is having any trouble hearing me, uh, it's my coworker Graciela, who who is awesome. But she's she's seen all this. You don't have to. You don't you don't need to hear me. It's fine. Um, again, I'm going to cut all this out of the webinar recording. So, but yeah, let me know if you guys have any other troubles. Okay, so in uh, these high severity patches, like what happens to the forest? Does the forest come back? Do do pines come back? Do conifers come back in general? And what you see is like in the wetter areas of uh, where these forests occur, like in the Western Sierra Nevada, or you know, especially on like the Northern facing slopes and slightly higher elevation, you'll see really quickly, like within not very many years, <laughs> uh, this is seven years post fire, high severity. This is like one of the largest high severity patches in the rim fire um, near Yosemite. And you will see like really quick regeneration of conifers, mostly what you're seeing here, ponderosa pine. Uh, but I've walked through this area and there's uh, every every different conifer species that was there before the fire um, is coming up from seed uh, throughout this big high severity patch. This happens very quickly um, in these in these areas. This is another area, another fairly what we call a mesic area, kind of a wet area. Uh, so there's plenty of precipitation. And, and this is actually through an intense drought period. So remember, this this fire occurred in 2013, and then that area was hit really hard by by the the drought um, in the Sierra Nevada, and still you have all this growth. It's quite amazing. This is a colleague of mine, um, and <laughs> you can see how tall these trees have become already, uh, and that's just in eight eight years in a high severity fire patch where all, all or most of the trees were killed. Now, as you go south or you get into drier areas, it's a little bit slower. The process is slower. And this is just based on um, site conditions, basically. Uh, so this is an area 14 years post-fire in the San Bernardino Mountains. And you see a lot of really good willow growth, a lot of good shrub growth here. Uh, you can still see all the, the standing dead trees, the snags that were killed by the fire. Uh, and you would, you know, maybe you see a conifer here or there, and you would say, oh, wow, these conifers aren't really coming back. Um, the thing is, if you look really closely, there actually are a lot of conifers, um, and and these are just the ones that I could see in this photo. Um, and so most of these are going to be saplings that are are sticking up above the the shrub canopy. But there's a lot of seedlings in there too, uh, and small saplings that I just I I'm not able to see. Uh, these shrubs can actually act as nurse plants that help um, you know protect these these trees uh, from getting trampled uh, or or um, you know anything foraging on them. Uh, and they also just provide a good mix of sunlight and shade. Uh, and a lot of these shrubs are actually nitrogen fixers. So they're putting nitrogen back in the soil too, uh, which can be really helpful after a fire. Uh, you can see, again, if you walk through these types of areas, which I've done quite a bit, uh, you will find little conifer saplings popping up through the shrubs all over the place. Now, here's an even drier area. This is on Pine Mountain. This is after the Pine Fire in 2016. So this is five years post-fire. Um, and I don't remember what time of year I was out here. I'm seeing some flowers. This must have been spring. Uh, but yeah, so you can see there's a lot of sugar pine, a lot of Jeffrey pine coming up. Uh, there's actually a white fir right there. So, you know, it's doing really well. It just takes, it takes longer, basically. Um, here's another area. This is Takuya Mountain. So this is up in the San Emilio Mountains in the Kern County area. I think this is a lot of this might be included in the project area, in the ecological restoration project area. Uh, but this was after a high severity fire on, on this mountain. And you can see really good uh, conifer regeneration here, mostly Jeffrey pine uh, coming up. You know, you can see a lot of the fallen logs and some snags here and there, uh, and a lot of ceanothus that, again, is a nitrogen fixing shrub. It's helping put nitrogen back in the soil. Uh, but you'll see a lot of times in these areas, it takes a while, but it also is kind of clumpy. So like you'll see clumps of trees coming up and they come up at sort of different times and that can help with long-term uh, resilience. Uh, the other cool thing that we see um, in our areas, so this is on Alamo Mountain after the day fire. This is 14 years after the day fire. Most of the black oaks that were here survived. So this is in the fall. They're turning a really lovely color because they actually are deciduous, one of the few deciduous trees we have around here. Um, 
and you can see they all resprouted from their base. So, you know, even though this was high severity fire and it killed most of the conifers, the black oaks have done really well. Uh, and conifers will eventually make their way back into this area, given enough time. This is going back to Takuya Mountain. Uh, these are not black oaks, but they're canyon live oaks. Same situation though, where they resprout from their base and they're doing they're doing really well. The thing is, um, again, going back to the mixed severity concept though, a lot of these areas don't burn at high severity. In fact, the majority of any given fire burns at low to moderate severity. And so that's the same with this fire. This was the Scott fire back on uh, back in 2006 uh, on Takuya Mountain. Uh, a huge portion of this fire, um, I think the majority of what was conifer forest that burned, um, burned at low, low to moderate, mostly low severity. And it looks like this. Um, so I'm kind of standing in the high severity patch. And you can see there's a lot of conifer, you know, saplings that have come up. Uh, but, you know, most of the, the mature trees actually did survive the fire. Uh, so it's important not to just, you know, become hyper-focused on these high severity patches and, and understand that there's actually still a lot of area that is burning at low to moderate severity. And the cool thing about this is that it can actually open up forest in exactly the way that it seems like the Forest Service says that they want, um, but fire can do it for free and it does it in a more natural way uh, that leaves behind uh, what we call uh, like biological legacies from the pre-fire ecosystem. So a lot of snags and logs, um, it can you know, really help with nutrient recycling in the soil. Uh, it can stimulate certain shrubs um, to grow in the understory. And so this is an area, uh, this is in the Great Valley area. This is 14 years after the day fire. Uh, you can see it's uh, a, a lovely you know, Jeffrey Pine forest here, and it's got a lot of cool stuff going on in the understory, a lot of uh, Great Basin sagebrush, some rabbit bush, um, and some other, um, some other shrubs and, and wildflowers if you're there the right time of year. This is the same fire pretty close by. This is along Fishbowl's Trail. Uh, this is only 13 years after the fire. A lot of nitrogen fixing shrubs, but again, got this kind of um, naturally opened forest condition from the fire. Uh, and this is the same area 14 years after the fire. You can see a lot of really good shrub growth here. Uh, and you will have these lovely patches of forest where um, they, they're, they're quite open uh, and they may have um, some cool stuff going on in the understory. This is Alamo Mountain. I'm just showing you a lot of photos because I, I think these visuals are important. Uh, this is Alamo Mountain again. And this is an area, uh, this was all mature, unmanaged forest. Uh, burned at low severity, uh, mostly. And you can see all of the black oaks, for the most part, survived and resprouted. So if you look at all these like white snags sticking up, uh, you'll see little clumps of orange. Those are, again, the black oaks that have resprouted from the base. Uh, and you've got really, um, really nice ponderosa pine forest, or Jeffrey pine forest here with some uh, white fir and sugar pine mixed in. And this is on Seward Mountain, really close by. This is the same fire. So this is after the day fire. You got some really nice sugar pines here that survived. This is more moderate severity. So you can see there's like little patches that burned where like most of the trees die, uh, died. But like if you were to look at this whole area as as sort of a, as a single unit, um, I would I would classify this as like the low end of moderate maybe uh, moderate severity. Uh, but it looks really good. And you've got a lot of um, black oaks that are coming up or that have resprouted. Uh, and and I haven't really walked through this area. So I would be curious to do that during the spring and see what um, like herbaceous you know, plants are coming up, uh, wildflowers, things like that. Uh, same area, this is Alamo Mountain, day fire. Again, unmanaged, uh, you know, mature forest, mostly Jeffrey Pine, burned at low severity uh, in the fire. So when we look at the, the Southern Kern County and Northern Ventura County, I think it's important to understand the sort of distribution of ecosystems. Uh, and this is where I'm gonna get a little bit more technical on you. Uh, so less of the photos, more maps and numbers and stuff. So again, this is the area that we're focused on today. And you can see that these dark green, that's like your true conifer forest. So that's gonna be uh, mixed conifer, um, Jeffrey pine, ponderosa pine, it, some, this data set classifies some of these areas as east side pine, which is actually only found on the eastern side of the Sierra Nevada, but we have some forest that is quite similar to that. It's mostly Jeffrey pine, uh, so it gets classified um, as east side pine. Also white fir forest. We don't have a lot of true white fir forest, a little bit on Pine Mountain, um, 
And then I also just went ahead and included subalpine conifer, which is a very small amount in this whole area. And it's mainly on um, the summits of, of uh, Mount Pinos and Cerro Noroeste. So you can see though, there's not a whole lot of true conifer forest. The forest that we're talking about when we talk about, you know, um, these fire regimes and forest thinning and stuff like that, right? What the uh, majority of this area is, is chaparral or some, some sort of shrubland ecosystem, mostly chaparral, but also this sort of, I don't know what this color is, I don't know what to call it, but this is pinyon juniper woodland. Um, I would not categorize it as like conifer forest. It, it just has a totally different fire regime than these other forest types. Um, it, it's just different and, and I'll explain that. So this is like your classic pinyon juniper. You'll see this along Highway 33 as you're coming down um, the north side of Pine Mountain. Really cool habitat, um, just fascinating. Uh, a lot of neat plants grow here uh, that only come up for a very short time of the year after the rains. It, it's, it's pretty cool. But a lot of what you're seeing here is uh, California juniper. And then you'll see these uh, pinyon pine, single leaf pinyon pine all over the place too. So this is like, really classic pinyon juniper. It's almost more of like a shrubland. Uh, and a lot of times this is, is a little bit open, uh, a, little, a little sparser. Uh, but most of the pinyon juniper that we have in the area is more dominated by pinyon pine, single leaf pinyon pine. And it tends to be old growth. Uh, some of the largest pinyon pines that you will see in California are going to be in this, in this area. It's a really cool place. I am just endlessly fascinated by this ecosystem. Uh, this is along Lockwood Valley Road. Uh, it's just, it's a wonderful, wonderful habitat type. There's a lot of cool things going on in it. Uh, what the research shows, um, and I don't, there's not a lot of debate about this to my knowledge, but in Southern California, in, the, in this particular vegetation type, in this ecosystem, um, you have naturally very long fire rotations. So the period of time it takes for, you know, an area, a, a given area to burn uh, at least once. Um, those rotations are usually measured in centuries rather than in years or decades, very similarly to um, chaparral. But I would say it even, it probably burns less often than, than chaparral naturally. Uh, and that's just because it's in a very arid area. There's not a lot of lightning strikes out here. Um, and, it just, uh, you know, there's not a lot of vegetation in the understory that can provide continuity for fires to easily move through these places uh, along the surface. Um, but when fire does occur, it tends to occur as high severity canopy, you know, crown fire. Uh, and that has been going on, uh, we know, since before the modern fire suppression era, there's some really good um, uh, data from the late 1800s, early 1900s uh, that talks about, um, that, that shows this sort of um, fire regime of long fire rotations characterized by, uh, you know, infrequent high severity fire. And it takes a long time after fire comes through here, it takes a while for those pinyon pines to fully reestablish. It can take decades. Uh, it's a very slow growing ecosystem. And so what you get in the early stages, the early successional stages after fire is usually more of a sagebrushy um, habitat. So you can still see that if you go out to the day fire, because the day fire area uh, includes a lot of pinyon juniper, you will find plenty of places that were mature pinyon, um, pinyon pines mostly. And right now they are more uh, dominated by ceanothus and sagebrush. And it will be a while still before the pinyons come up. And that's a natural part of the fire regime. It just takes a very long time, and that's been going on, um, uh, you know, well before the, the era of modern fire suppression. So let's look at the fuel break and defense zones. This is, again, most of the project area is going to fall within this category in, in this region. And you can see that it really is targeting these shrubland areas and the uh, pinyon juniper woodland. The, the pinyon juniper alone is 42% of the, uh, the fuel break and defense zones within uh, Southern Kern County and Northern Ventura County. Uh, and shrubland is another 37%. So there's very, you know, there's not a lot of forest, uh, but where there is forest, again, they can remove trees of any size, uh, retaining just some trees, right? Um, 
quite concerning. But I'm I am really concerned about uh, we are really concerned about these pinyon juniper woodland areas because they are they can be quite sensitive to mechanical disturbance, um, and they have a lot of uh, rare uh, plant species that grow in them. And so if we look at the forest health treatment units, even these, and this is easily uh, this particular area, Northern Ventura County and Southern Kern County has the, the, the most true, you know, mixed conifer and Jeffrey pine forest in the Los Padres um, by far. And even in these forest health treatment units, uh, these true conifer forest types are, they only make up less than 40% of the forest health treatment units. So a lot of this is gonna be in pinyon juniper and some chaparral uh, and, that, and that is concerning for a lot of different reasons. So here are just a, a handful of places that are within the project area. This is in the Great Valley area. Um, if you've ever ridden um, off-road vehicles out there, I think this is on the, what is this called? The yellow or the, Piano box loop, I think. Piano box? Something like that. Um, this is the summit of Mount Pinos. This is a really cool uh, plant called paintbrush. This is one, one species of paintbrush. Uh, very pretty. I, this is one of my favorite photos I've taken. Um, so all of this is included in the project area. This is on Alamo Mountain. Really nice big um, uh, oak here and some, some Jeffrey pine. And then uh, this is the Highway 33 corridor. This is, there would be a fuel break along this. And this is um, some pinyon juniper habitat, some really open pinyon juniper in the Apache Canyon area. All of these are within the project area. So let's just sort of go um, go back to this uh, just to give you kind of reorient you here. Uh, I want to talk about some of the other areas that are could be affected by by this proposal in this region. So if you've been following our work. Um, We've been working with a bunch of different partners, uh, Cal Wild, uh, Pew Charitable Trust, uh, Sierra Club, uh, a, a bunch of other names that I'm I'm not I'm going to forget, and I I'm not trying to exclude you. Just a lot of different groups have been working on this bill uh, that's currently in Congress. It's actually passed the House of Representatives a couple of times, including this year, and it's awaiting a vote in the Senate. Uh, but this would uh, establish a lot of new wilderness. It would designate a lot of new wilderness areas uh, in the Los Padres National Forest and the Carrizo Plain National Monument. And uh, some of this includes like the Chumash. This would be at these orange areas are wilderness additions. So if that bill were to pass and get signed into law, like these, these areas would be added to the Sespe Wilderness. This would be added to the Sespe Wilderness. This would be added to the Dick Smith Wilderness. These two would be added to the Chumash Wilderness. And uh, these little gray areas, those are uh, the, the project area. And you can see there's definitely some overlap. It's it's not a lot in some of these places, uh, except for this. Uh, this is what we call the Boulder Canyon unit of the Sespe Wilderness Editions. And there is a big fuel brick that cuts right through it. Um, and that that is certainly an issue. Uh, but all in all, it's about 2,500 acres, a little over 2,500 acres of proposed wilderness are included uh, in the project area within northern Ventura County and Kern County. In terms of inventoried roadless area, however, now these are specially designated areas that um, uh, have this like undeveloped character. They generally don't have roads. Uh, they can have trails and they can also have um, small roads. It's, it's a little confusing. It doesn't mean that like non-motorized activity or uh, it's only allowing non-motorized activities. Um, it, it's definitely a little wonky, but uh, these are specially protected areas under the inventoried roadless uh, or the the roadless area conservation rule of 2001, and a lot of the project area within this uh, specific region is within an inventoried roadless area, 41 almost 42,000 acres. Uh, some of these, like the Antimony roadless area, are especially impacted. Uh, there's a lot of project area up here. Uh, and we are uh, very concerned about these sort of intrusions, uh, you know, into these inventory roadless areas. So in terms of fuel breaks, I just want to show you some examples of where they haven't worked when it mattered the most, right? So 
a fuel break, the whole purpose of it is that you change the vegetation type along a swath of land from one type to another type. And usually it's like going from shrubs to grasses or something. Uh, it's to try to change like potential flame lengths and stuff like that. And it's and it's really designed to allow firefighters to do fire suppression activities. That That is the point of them. Um, the Forest Service will often say that they're not intended to stop fires on their own. Uh, but that if firefighters are present, that they can be useful for stopping or slowing fires. So um, let's like look and see how that actually works. So this is in the um, I did it again. Uh, this is the Camino Cielo fuel break here in the San Inez Mountains. This is like Goleta out here. So I know I'm kind of out of the current in the Ventura County areas, but I need to. I, I want to show you a couple of examples here. So this is the Whittier fire. This should say before. I don't know why I keep forgetting to change that. Uh, but you can see a big fuel break all along the crest of the mountains here. This is before the Whittier fire, which occurred in 2017. And this is right after the fire. So you can see that the Whittier, um, this Camino Cielo fuel break really just kind of bisects this, uh, this fire area. And what actually happened, um, I've talked to some folks uh, about this who, who were, were there and, and actually know sort of the situation, but um, embers spotted uh, they traveled via the wind over this fuel break and they landed down here and then the fire kind of spread back toward itself. Um, that, and, that, and we see that a lot. And this is the main reason why fuel breaks don't work very well is because under wind, uh, under extreme wind conditions, not even sometimes that extreme, um, but as long as you've got wind uh, winds that are moving embers across the landscape, uh, fuel breaks just, they, they can't stop the wind. Uh, they can't stop embers. And so you can have long range spotting of embers that then start new fires and then um, those fires combine and then they burn back toward the main fire. Uh, and we see this time and time again. The reason this is important is because it's under these wind-driven conditions that uh, fires cause the most uh, acreage, bur they burn the most acreage and they cause the most damage to communities. So it's under these conditions that we would hope that fuel breaks would actually be effective, but it's exactly when they are the least effective. Hopefully that makes sense but it's really important. This is another one. This is in the Thomas fire area near Ojai. And you can see fuel breaks here, you know, big fuel break network uh, didn't do anything for the Thomas fire. Fire went right, right through this area. And this one, you know, I don't even think firefighters were really able to get on to this fuel break uh, because it's too dangerous when fires are moving really quickly and they're being spread, you know, driven by extreme winds. Uh, this was a Santa Ana wind. Um, event that was driving this the, the Thomas fire. Uh, firefighters are not going to be placed in those situations. It's really dangerous. And plus, they're going to be usually focused on protecting homes if, if they're nearby. This is another one. This is up in Slow County. This is West Cuesta Ridge. This is in the 60s, right before they put in a fuel break along here. That is the fuel break right after they uh, implemented it. Big swath of land that they cleared. Uh, this is it in 18, 1989. You can still see the fuel break is definitely still there. And then this is in 1994, right after a fire burned right through it. And again, it did not stop the fire from moving across this ridge multiple times. In terms of like thinning, you know, commercial thinning, which is a big part of this project, uh, we have definitely seen where uh, it is just not effective under more extreme weather conditions, especially. So this is in the Caldor fire in 2021. So this is last year, right? And this is where the fire started. It blew right through a bunch of areas that have been commercially thinned all through here, uh, burned down this town of Grizzly Flats. And most of these thinned areas burned at high severity. So uh, yeah, it's again, under those extreme weather conditions, which is when fires burn the most area, they do the most damage. It's also when the most high severity fire occurs is under these extreme weather conditions. Uh, these, these projects just don't, don't do a whole lot. This is the North Complex. This is from 2020. Fires started up here as two fires. They kind of merged. They weren't doing a whole lot until this big wind event came. Uh, I think it had like 45 mile per hour winds. It was this dry, cold front. Pushed it within 24 hours all the way to this little town of Berry Creek. Burned down a bunch of homes, killed, killed several people. Uh, and it burned right through uh, a lot of areas that had been uh, logged, you know, thinned, uh, even had a lot of prescribed burning, you know, pile burning, all sorts of stuff um, that just didn't didn't stop the fire. And the same with the Dixie fire. Uh, the fire started down here, 
and it just really blew up and went through huge swaths of land that had been intensively managed, you know, intensively managed forest land specifically. Uh, this was all private land that uh, the, the private timber company that owns it uh, had on their website that they didn't expect, you know, to A, even have fire be an issue in their lands because they take such good care of it and that there wouldn't be, um, at least if fire did occur, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be very high severity. Uh, this is, <laughs> if you're, I don't have a, I don't have a fire severity map, but this is like where a huge patch of high severity uh, occur, occurred. And it was probably the fastest um, that the fire moved. It moved within just hours. It moved from like here all the way to up here, right through this land. Uh, and they have been doing all sorts of thinning activities for for decades. So again, it is the weather is the most important factor in terms of how fire moves across the landscape generally. These big fires, topography can also play a really important role, and 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 the vegetation can to some extent as well, um, especially under more mild weather conditions. Uh, I've written about some of this. If you guys want to check out some some papers, I'm happy to share these. Uh, these are both from this year. A really cool one I, I wrote with a, a few a colleagues uh, from the University of Wyoming and from Wild Heritage and John Muir Project. Um, this one is really just about the need to shift the sort of paradigm of how we deal with fire and forest management in, in the Western United States. And then this one is about the Caldor fire, which I just showed you a moment ago. And this is about cumulative tree mortality, which is an important aspect of all this. Basically, the number of trees that are killed by the thinning or the you know the project itself plus the fire um, people don't often think of it that way and then uh, if you want to look at you know a, a very specific fuel break study this was specific to the southern california national forest including the los padres and what they found was that fuel breaks were not very effective especially under um, more uh, uh, under more extreme weather conditions um, but what they sort of the, one of their conclusions was constructing fuel breaks in remote backcountry locations will do little to save homes during a wildfire. Uh, and I, I think I have a map. I don't, I don't think I'm going to show it today for the sake of time, but uh, most of this project area is more than tw a quarter of a mile from structures. Uh, I think 80, 80, almost 80% 80 of it is more than a quarter of a mile away from structures. Uh, and the farther you get away from structures, the less effective your vegetation management project is for protecting those structures. Now, what happens next? Um, we're in kind of the early phases here. So they have proposed this, they've, the, we're in what's called the scoping comment period, which ends on September 27th. Uh, the agency has proposed uh, what they're wanting to do. They're saying that they're going to develop an environmental assessment, which you're only supposed to do if you're not sure that significant impacts to the environment are likely. Uh, with a 235,000 acre project that affects, um, you know, 104,000 acres of inventory roadless areas, 56,000 acres of designated critical habitat for threatened and endangered species, uh, includes a, a lot of mechanical, you know, heavy equipment use all over the landscape would impact um, uh, lots of riparian areas. I think it's safe to say that there are going to be significant impacts and what we have been asking the Forest Service to do is just scrap this whole situation and go straight to developing an environmental impact statement, which is a more robust form of environmental review and involves, um, usually involves more opportunity for people to comment. Uh, and, and generally, the, for, the, the agency would have to respond to comments within their document uh, that they issue. Uh, but what will likely happen is that the Forest Service will go through this less robust process. They'll develop an environmental assessment. They'll, they'll probably issue a finding of no significant impact, which will seem crazy to most people. Um, but this is what we see this a lot in other national forests. And then regardless of how they do this, there will be what's called an objection period. Um, and that is before a decision is actually made. And this is a non-litigation um, uh, activity basically it's like if you have standing which means like if you submitted comments during comment periods uh, and you have standing to object you can file an objection to the final environmental document that they um, they publish and you can say well i really think that this should be different um, i think you didn't incorporate enough mitigation strategies into this you know uh, and then that can some of those concerns can be incorporated into a decision 
Um, so this can be a somewhat useful process. We've we've utilized it before, and and it can help avoid having to go to court afterward. Um, but you know what could happen is that they still issue a decision notice, um, which is sort of the final document, and it may allow all the stuff to go forward. And uh, then the only option would be litigation. So if you want to participate in objection, um, you can do that as an individual. You can do that as an organization. Uh, you need to submit a comment now, uh, especially. You need to get into the record as having standing to do that. I do just want to point out one last thing. Um, the Forest Service has prepared environmental impact statements for projects before. <laughs> this is nothing new. And the last time they prepared one for a project like this was in 2018. They issued the uh, environmental impact statement for a big fuel break project in the Monterey Ranger District. And it was a whopping 400, 542 acres. I thought this was a, I, I was concerned about this project at the time. And now we're dealing with a 235,000 acre project, 186,000 acres of which are fuel breaks. Um, across just a vast, I mean, like a, a huge area, right? And they're saying that instead of doing an environmental impact statement, they would just, they can just do an environmental assessment. Uh, again, 400 times the size of this project, and they want to do a less robust environmental um, review process. Uh, it, it is just kind of mind boggling. But if you want to submit a comment, you can really easily do that through our website. We have lpfw.org slash ERP. Uh, very easy to submit a comment. Uh, that way, it'll go straight through to the Forest Service, uh, and it'll, it'll give you standing to object uh, later if you want to do that, or uh, maybe you want to file a lawsuit down the road, right? Um, you have to submit comments now. And we highly recommend personalizing these comment letters, uh, talking about specific areas that might be affected. And if you want to know specific areas, uh, check out our interactive map, lpfw.org slash erp map. And if any of you are interested who are here today and have questions, we can go through this map a little bit and I can show you how to use it. Uh, we can also look at specific areas, but this is a great way to look at some of the places that are going to be affected by this. And you can incorporate that information that you gain from this into your comment letter if you'd like. So that's it. Uh, let's start with the q and I always go a little longer than I mean to with these presentations, but there's just so much to cover, even when we're trying to focus on a very specific area. So I've got some questions. Um, the first one is, what do they do with all these piles um, with uh, the trees 10 inches in diameter or smaller, maybe? Uh, do they just get left there? How can they do a pile on the forest floor and not damage the surrounding trees? Yeah, okay, so you're talking about pile burning. Yeah, they basically just pile up all that slash material, the smaller trees, anything that's not gonna be sold off you know, as firewood or as commercial timber um, that usually gets, uh, put into piles and then they will burn them when the conditions are allowable, uh, allow, allow this to happen. They will do, basically it's like a bonfire. And um, can it damage nearby trees? You know, that doesn't usually happen. I've seen, I mean, pile burns done in like the winter. There's still snow on the ground. It's really weird. And that's not, that's obviously not part of the natural fire regime. Pile burning isn't part of the natural fire regime. Uh, it's not part of cultural burning, right? I mean, it's like, uh, it's a very, it's a very modern thing that is done. But uh, what we do know is that it can actually cause a lot of um, problems with the soil in those areas. And if you've got a lot of pile burns across the landscape, uh, especially if they're close, close to each other, um, you can actually sterilize the soil in a, in a lot of places. And that, and that can be a problem. I've been in areas that were pile burned years ago, and they still have absolutely nothing growing in them. Uh, maybe like a, you know, a non-native grass here and there. Um, it's very different than when a fire comes through because fires come through relatively quickly comparatively. You know, it may take like, it may burn across an area in a matter of minutes to hours, um, but not usually days. And it, it's usually not putting a lot of heat down into the soil. Um, but yeah, that, that is definitely an issue. Pile burning is an issue. So another question, question for later. So is the agency, <laughs> uh, like what's going on with the agency? Uh, I have two questions about this. Um, like why, why is the agency doing this? Why are they sort of ignoring the massive opposition to the Pine Mountain or Reyes Peak project? Uh, these are great questions. I mean, the Pine Mountain project, 755 acres, got 16,000 comments of opposition. It's being litigated by a lot of different groups, including a county and a city government. Um, and the Forest Service has definitely not gotten the hint, it seems like. I would say the big reason is 
Oh gosh, there's okay. There's a couple of reasons. One, the agency is is unusual in that it can do timber sales and keep the profit, um, keep the revenue as uh, like to then do other things, right? So the agency, in some ways, in, in it's usually not in the Los Padres or in Southern California in general, uh, because our forests were not designated as timber producing forest. Uh, but especially in the timber producing forest, the, the Forest Service is a little bit more like a timber company in in some ways. Um, and because of the way they can deal with revenue from these sales. Uh, I'd say here, you know, there's, I think there's definitely been motivation, certainly through the Trump uh, era, there was a lot of push to try to do more and more timber sales and to try to push through projects with as little environment, as little environmental review as possible. Um, you know, I think that we're still seeing a lot of that, even in the Biden administration. I, I would say this administration has not improved a whole lot uh, uh, compared to the, the past administration. There's a lot of inertia in this agency, which, and again, the agency is in uh, the Department of Agriculture. So it is, is a little unusual in that sense too. Um, but I would say they, the Congress has allocated a lot of money. They Their appropriations for um, these types of projects has drastically increased in just the last couple of years. I mean, just look at the um, the infrastructure bill that was passed, then the uh, Inflation Reduction Act that was passed. Billions of dollars can go to these types of projects now, um, and so all of these agents, all of these national forests and regions. Um, so, so the Forest Service is split up into regions, just like every uh, major governmental agency, like the EPA and uh, Fish and Wildlife Service. So. Um, each region is vying for money, you know, that's coming from Congress. And then each forest within each region is vying for that same money as well. And so what I think is going on here is that the Forest Service and the Los Padres, they want to be able to show that, like, oh, look, we did all of the environmental review. We're shovel ready is, is the term that's often used um, across 235,000 acres. So just give us the money and we'll start doing the work. It's just easier to get money, I think, to um, once they have all this stuff, you know, the environmental aspect of it approved. I think that's what's going on here. Um, there's just so much money floating around. PG&E is apparently giving the Forest Service money to do this kind of stuff. Um, yeah, money is the answer. Whether it's because somebody in a timber company is making profit, you know, and uh, <laughs> laughing on their way to the bank, or whether the agency is just wanting to get more funds to do this kind of work, um, it, it's money, you know. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so we have to change the way the US Forest Service is funded. Yeah, I mean, I think we need to get them out of the commercial logging business for sure. Uh, there need to be, I think there need to be some pretty major changes to how some of these projects are able to get pushed through the environmental review process really easily. I mean, there's like a, a, a true paradigm shift is needed in the way that this agency operates. Uh, most of the agency is uh, focused in terms of the budget and just personnel. It's mostly focused on, on fire, fire suppression generally, um, but it's also supposed to be a resource management agency in the sense that they are supposed to manage a lot of recreation um, places. I would say the majority of I don't know if this is exactly true. I, I need to, I need to calculate this. But across the U.S., I would say the majority of recreation sites in on federal land is probably within national forest in terms of campgrounds, trail length of trails, you know, um, and the agency just their funding for that has been shrinking, <laughs> but their funding for fire suppression and fire mitigation activities has just been ballooning. So. Yeah, I think I think a lot needs to change. Uh, the agency, though, it also dabbles in other things, right? It's um, it permits oil and gas drilling, uh, uh, you know, mining, uh, great lots of commercial grazing. You know, there's there's all sorts of activities that can happen in, in national forests, and I will tell you that those activities are certainly occurring, but the environmental review aspect of them is what has been getting um, sort of pushed aside. And so they try to go through these things really rapidly uh, without very much environmental review. Is the Sierra Club involved in this effort? Uh, yes, they are, yeah. Um, more generally, from a broader perspective, yes, uh, across the country and in the Western United States specifically, but also locally, the um, 
both of our local chapters signed on to a letter that we submitted to the Forest Service a couple of weeks ago, I want to say. Um, so that would be the uh, Santa Barbara Ventura chapter and the Santa Lucia chapter, both signed on to our letter, along with uh, 70 other organizations asking for the Forest Service to extend the comment period and prepare an environmental impact statement. They extended the comment period by 30 days, which was nice. Uh, they are still saying that they just want to prepare an environmental assessment rather than an impact statement. Um, someone asked, is part of the answer in centering the health and viability of mature and old growth, like 80, 80 years, 21 inches or so? Um, there's actually a lot going on right now to try to define old growth on national forest, uh, on public lands in general, and, uh, and how to protect those. I have had meetings personally with some, um, some higher ups at the Forest Service or at the USDA, and I will just say that they are <laughs> vehemently opposing protections of old growth forests that, in, that would like ban logging. They absolutely want to continue doing logging activities in old growth forests. They won't call it logging. Um, and that's the thing, and I could have a whole presentation just about euphemisms in this world um, of, of forest management. Um, they'll call it thinning, right? Or commercial thinning. Um, it's just logging. I, I, and, and the Forest Service gets so irritated with us when we say this is a logging project. Uh, the, the definition of logging is really simple. Are you cutting trees and sell, <laughs> selling them generally is, is how you usually talk about logging. Um, uh, if yes, then yeah, it's logging. You know, you're you're cutting you're cutting trees. Um, you're <laughs> you're creating logs, and uh, a lot of those are going to be sold to a timber company or you know sent to a sawmill. Uh, a lot of it may be chipped up and sent to a biomass facility. That's got a whole host of issues just in and of itself. Uh, and then of course some of it may just be pile burned. But um, the fact of the matter is, the Forest Service wants to continue cutting a lot of trees, even in old growth forest. Uh, so defining old growth is really important. I think the definition is going to change depending on where you are, the different forest types. You know, what is what is um, old growth in the eastern United States may be different than in the western United States. What is old growth in subalpine conifer is going to be different than what's old growth in closed cone pine cypress forest, right, in the western United States. Uh, old growth in redwoods may be different. I mean, there's just, there's, there's so much complexity to that. Um, but in general, we are supportive of trying to protect old growth as much as possible from these mechanical disturbances. Um, I think it's a little bit more nuanced when you start talking about like prescribed fire, uh, especially if it's prescribed fire without having to do all this, you know, thinning beforehand. Uh, that can be useful to some extent in certain forest types if, if done uh, in an ecologically appropriate manner. Um, but yeah, it's, it's pretty complicated. Thanks for the question. Anybody else? Any other questions? Good questions so far. I really appreciate it. I'm happy to look at the map, um, the interactive map, if anyone has any questions about specific areas, like maybe you're unsure if an area is included in the project area. I can, I can easily go through that if you'd like. Okay, well, um, no other questions. I appreciate everyone being here. Uh, we will have a couple of other um, webinars coming up. So let me think, September 13th, is that right? September 13th, we'll have another webinar, same time. It'll be focused on Santa Barbara County. And then on the 15th, I think it's the same week. Uh, so I think this is on a Tuesday and then on a Thursday, uh, same time, again, 11.30 a.m. And that will be the the 15th will be focused on slow county and current or slow and monterey counties uh, so if you're interested in any of those places come check that come check it out it'll be similar to this one i'm going to try to shorten it i i, I don't want to give so much background information about the project i'd rather talk more about the specific areas and you know ecosystems affected um, so yeah those will be upcoming we also have a hike if you want to come on a hike that i will be leading at Davy Brown Trail. That'll be on Sunday, September 18th. We had originally scheduled it for this Sunday, uh, but there's this little heat wave that's uh, happening where it's gonna be like 105 degrees out there. Uh, so we we post we 
rescheduled it to September 18th. So if you want to come out to the Figaro Mountain area in Santa Barbara County, uh, I'm just going to lead a hike into a, a huge um, chunk of area that is within the project uh, in Fir Canyon or along Davy Brown Trail, right on the sort of north side of Figaro Mountain. That'll be really cool. There will be a, um, a lot of like Big Cone Douglas fir that we'll get to see and some other ecosystems. Um, that'll be really fun. So you can sign up for that. Just let me know if, if you're interested in that. You can go to our website. All of this stuff is on our website on the homepage if you look on the left uh, and you can easily find the like RSVP links. So, and thank you. Uh, yeah, I see, <laughs> I see your comment. Um, yeah, skimpy 17 page description. That, that is an accurate way to put it. Skimpy, <laughs> skimpy uh, project proposal. Yeah, it's, there's not a lot of information in it. Um, and a lot of it could change. I mean, hopefully it'll change for the better, you know. One thing that we're asking for is that I mean, we'd really like to see the Forest Service just sort of go back to the drawing board on this thing and uh, it, you know drop a lot of these areas that are in remote places, especially in riparian zones, um, you know, sensitive ecosystems, uh, special areas like the Cuesta Ridge Botanical Area on West Cuesta Ridge. You know that the entire that entire botanical area is included within the project area. Um, you know, and just focus on vegetation immediately adjacent to homes, you know, right along the edge of communities instead. Uh, and to prepare a more robust environmental um, analysis, you know, go through the full environmental impact statement process. This, this is going to, you know, this project, if it goes through the way that the Forest Service is planning, it will impact the Los Padres for um, well over a decade, you know, probably the next 20 years. So it's important that the Forest Service does their due diligence on this and uh, go about this the right way. Uh, but a lot of it is just is unnecessary. So. Okay, great. Well, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to stop the recording. I do appreciate everyone who's watching. Um, if you're watching this at a later date, there should be some links below that might be useful. Check out our website, um, lpfw.org, if you want to get more info on any of this. And feel free to reach out to me. Uh, you can, uh, you can email me. Uh, bryant at lpfw.org uh, if you have any questions. You can also check us out on social media. We, uh, Forest Watch, we are uh, very active on Instagram. We're also on uh, Facebook and Twitter. Um, I'm on Instagram, Bryant Shrublander, and I'm also on Twitter as Wildland Maps. I do a lot of, I just post stuff about maps and a lot of it's related to fire. So if you want to learn more about these things, feel free to follow us. Uh, we have a lot of educational posts. Uh, thanks for watching. Hope to see you again soon.